In this video, we'll explore some of the ideas behind static equilibrium. First, static equilibrium means that we have constraints. First, the linear acceleration has to equal zero, and the angular acceleration also has to be zero. In order for those conditions to be met, the sum of the linear forces have to be zero, and the sum of the torques have to be zero. Provided those conditions are met, we are going to have static equilibrium. Let's take a look at how we can use static equilibrium in a couple of daily activities. The first one's going to be quiet standing. So we're simply just going to try and stand in an erect position. Before we begin, we have to understand two fundamental concepts. The first is a base of support. The base of support is going to be a perimeter that's going to be outlined by those things that are in contact with the ground. During quiet standing, we only have two feet in contact with the ground. So the perimeter that's being drawn around the two feet are going to equal the base of support. Notice that the different stances are going to have different widths or lengths of the base of support depending on which dimension we're talking about. The next fundamental idea to understand is the center of pressure. We can think about the center of pressure as being somewhat analogous to the center of mass. We said that our mass was distributed throughout our entire body. But if all that mass were concentrated into one point, that one point would be the center of mass. Well, same thing. During standing, we can say that the ground reaction force is actually distributed across all contact points in contact with that ground. But just like we did for center of mass, we are going to say that that ground reaction force is going to be concentrated at one particular point. That one particular point is going to be referred to as the center of pressure. Now, it's also important to realize that the center of pressure cannot be outside the base of support. The center of pressure represents a contact force, that contact between the foot and the ground. Therefore, that center of pressure cannot be located outside of the base of support. So during quiet standing, if we want to maintain static equilibrium, that means that we're going to have certain constraints. This particular model here is going to represent a foot, an ankle joint, and then the center of mass that's going to be located on top of a massless rod. We can look at the angle of sway, or the angle from the vertical, denoted by my theta. We are going to have the center of mass creating a force due to gravity that's going to act downward from that location of the center of mass. We're going to have a ground reaction force which is going to be acting upward from the foot. We have a perpendicular distance from the ankle joint center to the center of pressure, and we have a perpendicular distance from the ankle joint center to the center of gravity. Recall that static equilibrium means that the linear accelerations have to be zero, and the angular accelerations have to be zero. That means the sum of the forces have to be zero, and the sum of the torques have to be zero. This means that the ground reaction force has to be equal in magnitude in opposite direction to the force due to gravity. Additionally, the torque of the ground reaction force has to be equal in magnitude in opposite in the direction of the torque due to gravity. Note that the force due to gravity itself is negative. So if the force due to gravity is negative and we multiply that by a negative force due to gravity, that means that number has to be positive. In other words, the ground reaction force has to be positive to counteract the negative ground reaction force. Additionally, if the torque due to gravity is going to create a negative torque, that means that the torque due to ground reaction force has to be positive. So what does this look like? Well, if we look at our little schematic here, and if our center of gravity is going to be anterior to our center of pressure, as denoted in figure A, that is going to create an anterior rotation, or in this case, a clockwise or negative rotation of the body's center of mass. Similarly, if that center of pressure ends up being anterior to the center of gravity, that is going to create a posterior, or in this case, a counterclockwise direction of the center of mass. In this way, modulating our center of pressure is going to keep our center of gravity, or our center of mass, inside the confines of our base of support. If we start to sway forward a little bit, we'll move that center of pressure forward, and that's going to rotate our center of mass back. 
If we're rotating back, we'll move our center of pressure posterior, and that's going to cause our center of mass or our center of gravity to rotate forward. So if we, again, if we look at our schematic here on the left, we can say the torque due to the ground reaction force is larger than the torque due to gravity, and that's going to cause us to rotate in the posterior direction. Whereas in the figure on the left, the torque due to gravity is larger than the torque of the ground reaction force, and that's going to cause us to rotate in the negative or the clockwise direction. We can also use these relationships to say how far can we lean forward without falling or taking a step. This is going to be known as our angle of sway. That angle is determined from the vertical. And note here that we are looking at the angle from the vertical. We can look at our hypotenuse as being the length of the center of mass. That is the length from the ankle joint center to where that mass is located at. And the length of the center of pressure is going to end up being the opposite side of our right triangle. So we can see that our angle of sway, or theta, is going to be equal to the negative of the arc sine of the location of the center of pressure divided by the location of the center of mass. In class, we will talk about some of the constraints that are going to affect what that angle of sway is. Finally, let's look at holding a glass. We have looked at transporting a glass back and forth from our mouth in terms of linear kinematics. We've also talked about creating forces in order to prevent the cup from slipping when we talked about friction. Here, let's talk about torques that are going to have to be accounted for by the central nervous system in order to hold a glass steady. Note that every finger, including the thumb, and I'm going to include the thumb in this discussion here, are going to create essentially two forces. It's going to create a normal force and a tangential force. Additionally, we are going to have the weight of the glass. So if we add all of those up, we will say the weight of the glass plus each finger creating two forces. That means that we are going to have to control 10 different forces that are acting on the cup. Next, the central nervous system is going to have to control all the torques that are acting on the cup as well. If we take all the torques about the center of mass, we can say that the force due to gravity is not going to create a torque. All the fingers, and again, we are going to include the thumb with all the fingers, are also going to be creating torques. In fact, each one creates two forces. Those two forces create two torques. So it's kind of remarkable to think about that the central nervous system has to be able to control 11 forces and 10 torques, and we do so almost daily without even thinking about it. But the sum of all those forces and the sum of all those torques have to be equal zero if we are going to maintain static equilibrium and hold the cup still. That's a pretty remarkable feat, don't you think? And that ends our discussion on static equilibrium.